One of the many profound things that happens at Pacifica is how students begin to see words as sacred living beings who carry our soulful expressions into the world. Words, according to James Hillman, are personal presences which have whole mythologies, genders, genealogies, etymologies concerning origins and creations, histories and vogues. Like images, words are alive and sold and deserving of our careful attention. In this spirit, it's useful to remember that the word psychology means to study the soul, while depth psychology, as espoused by Carl Gustav Jung, is to study the soul by engaging with the fathomless creative unconscious. According to Jung, the psyche, or soul, is made up of conscious and unconscious components. Besides a conscious self, we all have a personal unconscious and are also psychically linked to a broader collective unconscious. The collective unconscious is a massive autonomous force inhabited by archetypes and other psychic contents which energetically propel all life forward. Archetypes are primordial psychic patterns for certain kinds of behavior. Hillman says that archetypes are living natural forces with intentionalities, the capacity to move, to form history, make effects, influence, leaf and flower and have ramifications. The function of the archetype, according to Jung, is nothing short of the creation of consciousness. They draw it into being so that life may be lived. This autonomous psychic force is inherently creative and continuously producing symbolic images with which to communicate its intentions and needs. These images come together and form numinous narratives upon which all our lives are built, often without our conscious awareness. We encounter them every night in dreams and see them in our fantasies. It's how myths, fairy tales, and folklore are created. The creative unconscious is also responsible for all that humanity produces in terms of art, literature, dance, music, poetry, and the sciences. Even wars, racism, misogyny, and religious persecution are born from the creative unconscious, for this psychic realm is both light and dark. In the hours and days following my first visit to Pacifica, I was confronted with three exceedingly vivid synchronicity events that shook me to my core and marked my first direct encounter with the psyche and its power. Once classes began, I was keenly drawn to the idea of archetypes. In particular, I was amazed by Jung's assertion that without the numinous siren song of the archetype, consciousness would rather not exist at all. I tried to imagine what this might feel like, this non-existence of consciousness. Something peaceful and evocative beckoned to me from that liminal space. I made a momentous discovery when I learned about the hermit archetype and saw the extent of my deep-seated identification with it. I could see and feel how this psychic pattern at least, this archetype, fit me like a glove. I understood why I had been so unhappy for so long. In my old life, all my endeavors were gargantuan literal affairs that I used to prove my self-worth. It's not that there wasn't any beauty, truth, or value in these efforts. It's just that there were so many unconscious dark beings living within me and my work, jumping out of me unexpectedly and making everything I did and said a little bit terrifying. I could not articulate it at the time, but these heroic efforts on behalf of my ego were at least partial attempts to counteract the pain of being rejected and abused by the Father, both literally and spiritually. I was in the Joseph Campbell class, scrutinizing my 12-year Harry Potter obsession when it dawned on me. I was deeply unhappy in my previous life with its busy tyrannical heroism because I am a hermit and magician by nature. I come alive in solitude. I need long hours spent gaining first-hand knowledge of the mysteries of life, deepening and clarifying my own infinite soul, and by extension, the soul of the world. I made a short film about Harry Potter, recognizing that my long-term preoccupation with that story was Psyche's way of getting my attention, for the archetypes badly want to live out their lives and can only do so with the ego's cooperation. If we refuse to cooperate, things can go very wrong. 
or else we can be overtaken with profound unhappiness and long bouts of depression. The numinous power of the archetypes has a trans-conscious aspect which can be frightening. We get a sense that these energies are not altogether human, and certainly not under our control. It is perilous, therefore, to underestimate or ignore the influential power of archetypes. Indeed, it is profound ignorance of these unconscious powers that leads us astray as people, as nations, and as a race. If we remember that the psyche is an image and story-making creative force, we can easily see how myths are essentially symbolic biographies of the archetypes and all their friends and relatives. Mythological narratives identify the many psychic realities that manifest in human life and show us how to cope with them. They tell us when, where, and how we must suffer, and where and how to find support. They indicate our deepest afflictions and point the way to our hidden reservoirs of strength and creative potential. Studying mythology and learning to decipher the symbolic messages helps us see that we are not alone in our suffering, that suffering is not only universal but that it has a profound transformative purpose. Hidden deep in the psyche beyond the reach of consciousness lies a potential for self-knowledge on a magnificent scale. In order to reach it, we must become patient and dedicated explorers on a lifelong quest, digging ever deeper into the fathomless abyss, often with tears, terror, and anguish accompanying us. Like countless other women, I had been upholding the prevailing cultural values of the patriarchy without any awareness. I lived my life intellectually and critically, not mythically and symbolically. I was what Sylvia Brenton Pereira calls a good little daughter of the patriarchy, one-sided, incomplete, and desperately unhappy. I had lost all connection with any sort of feminine nature within myself. Indeed, I scarcely knew there was such a thing as a feminine nature at all. In mythic narratives, we studied the old Sumerian myth about the descent of Inanna. Here, at last, I felt a myth at work in my own life and experienced firsthand the soul-making function of mythology. Miraculously, we were studying active imagination and dream work in the same term, so I was able not only to read about Inanna's journey to the underworld, but also to explore her story in my dreams and to talk to her in active imagination, which are two of the primary ways for directly engaging with the symbolic output of the creative unconscious. In dream work, we mine the depths of each dream image for the many symbolic secrets it carries within itself until we intuitively arrive at the message that specific image is attempting to convey. In active imagination, we go one step further and actually speak with the images in a conscious waking state. We interact with dream images or with any image the psyche presents us with in the moment. The image can become a friend or an enemy, a fearful, challenging messenger, or a guardian and spiritual guide. We can even work with our emotions, affects, and complexes, and in this way we can have ongoing, intimate dialogues with our inner psychic family. This kind of work often leads to surprising discoveries and powerful, life-altering breakthroughs that beneficially transform our lives. Through dream work and active imagination with the myth of Inanna, I discovered that I had died and gone to the underworld where I was a decomposing corpse busy with the painful, arduous work of transformation. Having learned about the profound darkness within myself and others, I developed a kind of fiery impatience with any sort of foolishness which was in keeping with my rapidly solidifying hermetic and circular attitude toward the sacred. I spent the entire summer walking with Inanna through ancient Sumerian sand dunes and, Accompanied by whale song, I swam in the depths of her sister Ereshkigal's underworld domain. I wrote an extensive paper about my research and experiences and created 28 photographs using intuitively sourced ritual methods to commemorate my psychic moon cycle spent in the company of the goddess. This experience taught me the profound value of myths as an entryway into the life of the soul. It helped me make sense of my life. It helped me to stop struggling and to submit willingly to the death of my old self. The myth of Inanna promised renewal, regeneration, and wisdom as a reward for the painful work of dying. 
Working with this myth took away my fears and replaced them with a sense of purpose. Besides dream work and active imagination, another method Jung discovered for studying the soul was through the work of the ancient alchemists. Traditionally, alchemists are known as solitary men in bizarre-looking medieval laboratories crazily trying to turn lead into gold. They referred to their work as the opus and considered it to be a sacred and holy endeavor requiring a religious attitude, a work to which an entire life was dedicated unequivocally. The opus was profoundly secret, highly individual, and pursued alone over long, arduous, tedious years. Obviously hermetic, and another perfect archetypal fit for my personality. Jung saw that over the course of many centuries, no alchemist ever succeeded in turning lead into gold. He was bewildered by their persistence, and through many years of exhaustive research and study, he found that the opus was firmly rooted in a teleological psycho-spiritual function which kept it alive. Jung found in the metals, elements, planets, arcane symbolism and strange mystifying language potent symbols which thoroughly resembled the process of psychic individuation, what Jung called the process of soul-making. Jung further discovered that the inner structures of the psyche and its prolific propensity for manufacturing conflict through opposition corresponded perfectly with the alchemical function of the quaternio, in which double pairs of opposites were brought together in an effort to unify them. For Jung, the undifferentiated chaos and conflict of opposites in alchemy was a psychic phenomenon. This conflict, he said, will appear again and again until finally the right formula is found for the correlation of conscious and unconscious, and the personality is assigned its correct position between the two. He warned that every stage of the experience must be lived through, and that there is no feat of interpretation or any other trick by which to circumvent this difficulty, for the union of conscious and unconscious can only be achieved step by step. In other words, we must patiently endure the step-by-step -step process of transformation. There is no easy scheme to take us there sooner, and the work must be cohesively integrated and completed before we can emerge transformed from the cauldron. There is no guarantee either that the work will succeed. At any stage, everything can suddenly blow up and we must begin again from scratch. This is how it feels to me every time a raging complex re-emerges and hits me over the head with a cinder block. The psyche is a teleological entity and so too is alchemy. They both have specific goals. The goal of alchemy is the mysterium conjunctionis, the mystical marriage of sun and moon. And the goal of the psyche is expansion into more and more conscious awareness. Both involve a process whereby the chaos of undifferentiated elements is exposed to intense scrutiny and alternative energetic magic. In the unconscious, this process continually gives birth to new territory, which is then freshly trod by what Susan Rowland calls a colonizing ego. Still, within the process, moments of liminality abound, and it was in this kind of alchemical temenos that I first discovered the serious scholar within. Before I came to Pacifica, I had a dim but passionate notion that I would one day become a Shakespearean scholar. As in a time long, long ago, when I simply knew that one day I would become a superlative surfer, I sensed an inner certainty about my scholarly future. It was in our Shakespeare class that I first realized, really, really realized, that I could write. I finally understood what Susan had been telling us about scholarship being a creative act. I stopped using my high intellectual mind and started using the darker depths of my soul for writing. I watched in amazement as the characters from Macbeth started to live in my house with me, as words, sentences, and ideas of a rather high caliber began to form on the page before me. With complete astonishment, I watched myself researching the play, finding new reservoirs of knowledge, watching lectures on YouTube, even reading what Freud had to say about Lady Macbeth. I live my regular life on autopilot as the weird story of Macbeth with all its many archetypal ghosts and visions of madness consumed me. I understood at last what it meant to be an artist and where creativity comes from. 
Once again, I was dumbfounded by the creative power of the psyche. This class marked the halfway point and was a new magical threshold for me. Until then, I had felt insecure about my abilities and defensively fought the process in order to protect myself. But the alchemical nature of magical scholarship mixed with my inherent hermetic nature and exploded into a mystical marriage which illumined a life path I had only dreamed of before. The process of soul making and the holy quest of the alchemist both take unequivocal dedication, devotion, persistence, courage, humility, and an entire lifetime. Indeed, James Hillman believes the prerequisite for this kind of work is nothing short of madness. After all, he says, alchemy is a prolonged witness to madmen at work upon themselves. Hillman calls the Mysterium Conjunctionis illumined lunacy, a state of affairs in which solar consciousness and moon madness are marvelously conjoined. This is another way of saying that something magical happens when conscious and unconscious work together in harmony. This magical harmony is what I experienced within my soul while I wrote the paper on Macbeth. It's how I feel now as I speak these sacred words. My two years at Pacifica have functioned as a vas hermeticum, the glass vessel of the alchemist inside of which my soul and I have worked upon one another. I'm very grateful that although dead and decomposing in the underworld, I somehow found the correct vessel. But again, it was magical help from my best friend that did it. This is another beautiful mystery of Pacifica. Those of us mad enough to sincerely undertake the journey of transformation find our way here as if by magic. Discovering my aptitude for this kind of intense soulful inquiry has been an exhilarating journey that I shall continue by joining the Jungian and Archetypal Studies Department in the spring. I will feel very proud the day I become a doctor of philosophy, not least because it will beautifully signify my triumph over the deadly psychic influence of my father's hatred. After two years cooking in this holy vessel, I have discovered that I am an unapologetic hermit for whom self-knowledge is more important than any other thing in the world. I have discovered that I am a religious person and I dedicate all my work to the sacred spirit of the universe. I have discovered that I am the daughter of Artemis and that tending to plants and animals is where I shall find my vocation. I have discovered that I am a natural born artist and writer, a magician and an alchemist. In time, perhaps, there will be books and more painting exhibitions, published papers, lectures, possibly professorships, hopefully in Scotland where I want to live and explore fairy lore and magic. There will be medicinal herbs and discoveries about the subliminal world of plants. There will be farming and harvesting and experiments in the basement. There will be Shakespeare. Most importantly, most seriously, most intensely, beautifully, and poetically. There will be an end to the gut-wrenching suffering of the dark, unknowing spaces where I have no idea who I am, what I am doing, where I am going, or why I exist. Many years ago, I read Jung's autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Towards the end of the book, he basically says we exist to expand consciousness. I recall thinking at the time, why on earth is this information not being broadcast loudly all over planet Earth? Aren't so many of us stumbling around in the dark wondering why we're here, who we are, and what it all means? Jung patiently answered all these eternal questions with great devotion and compassion. He showed us how to discover our true selves individually in a uniquely sacred way and collectively as a world community. It is up to each of us to embark upon the voyage of transformation, for it is the only way the world will change for the better. As Jung says, a little less hypocrisy and a little more self-awareness will go a long way. This is as far as I've gotten on the road, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for your time today and wish you all Godspeed on your own sacred journeys. Thank you.